ladies and gentlemen, guests of this podcast, the man in your screen, if you're watching this on YouTube, I have aspired to be like him for many a year in my golf instruction career. I've known him from afar, thanks to a dear friend in Larry Myers. And now I finally get to talk to him on the show. Kip Peterbaugh, how are you doing? Welcome to our show. So good to see you. Thank you very much, Mark. I've always looked forward to talking to you. I've known a lot about you from Larry. So uh, <laughs> we both learned from Larry, which is a great source. <laughs> oh, well, knowing Larry, there, there wouldn't have been much uh, bad news because he's the eternal optimist to me. Yeah, he's one of the great guys out there. That's for sure. Well, speaking of great guys, you are one of those in golf instruction, certainly, if nothing else, a legend in Southern California, California proper. Um, but for our global audience, because we have a global tribe, tell folks a little bit about Kip, you know, how you came to where you are, just kind of the whistle stop tour through your career, please. Well, I was very fortunate to grow up in La Jolla and uh, Paul Runyon was the head pro at La Jolla Country Club at that time. And that was a time of booming golf. There was Gene Littler was at La Jolla, Chuck Courtney, John Schroeder. Um, it was just a golf mecca. Legends. And, all of them. <laughs> uh, and Runyon was a huge inspirational type character. He was so enthusiastic about golf. And uh, starting from the time I was about eight years old, I started hitting golf balls with my brothers. I have three older brothers and I just got hooked more and more and more. And uh, by the time I was 13, that's all I could do. I mean, I, I just wanted to play golf. And uh, Runyon was the teacher, and I just smashed balls until I turned blue in the face and, and ended up going to college at University of Houston, which at that time was the powerhouse of the country. Uh, there was 40 freshmen on our team. That was 1966. Wow. By the time 1970 came, it was 13 people on the team. Scholarships came around right around 69, 70, and so everything changed. Uh, the audio listeners and the YouTube folks can see me. I'm pointing at an award there behind my head. That is the Dave Williams Award, who was the lead. Oh. Uh, he, he was your coach, I guess, then for a little while, wasn't he? Yeah, he was the coach all the time. Yeah, quite a character. Well, but, uh, it was a wonderful experience. I just played golf all the time. and. There were some times where I was frustrated with the team because of just the way teams go, but it was great. I spent four years, graduated, and then missed the tour in 70 and 71, and then decided, well, I uh, watched Tom Watson putt in the PG at the stage tour of finals, and I said, I've never putted like that in my entire life. <laughs> and so I decided from that point, maybe I better get a job, and then I applied for jobs and ended up getting a job in Chicago of all places. I didn't even never dreamed of it. But I went to North Shore Country Club for Bill Ogden, and uh, then I went to Palm Springs with him as a resident professional. And the more I was in the business, the more I taught. Um, yeah. I've always been fascinated by the golf swing. I had stacks of magazines around my desk when I was supposed to be studying that I look at swings, and I didn't know what I was looking at. I just looked. And yeah. I think I just learned from osmosis, just looking at so many different swings, trying to figure out what ones work. And... Um, what commonalities they all shared and I just started teaching and when I moved back out to California I already was teaching quite a bit and then through a change of circumstances of the golf course I was at uh, they got a new ownership in and they fired everybody mm -hmm. sight and seen and so I'm whew. so I started teaching individually with a friend of mine down at a driving range and going up to Orange County and then sooner or later I opened a golf school in 1987 and uh we started our VR Golf Academy in 1991, and 32 years later, 32 years later, we're still there, and it's been a uh, quite a run. I'm very, very fortunate. Folks, listening to Kip, I'm holding the book here. We're going to talk about in a minute. I love the title. What you know can hurt you. <laughs> I, um, Kip has forgotten stuff about golf that a lot of folks listening to and watching this are still learning. And so, Kip, I just one more question before we get to the material. Um, the connection eventually with the touring professional, and you've worked with countless. I mean, Dennis Paulson's a friend. You worked with him. He's wrote the, written one of the forwards for this book. Uh, Scott Simpson, Larry Myers. Uh, golly, the list is endless. You've, you've gone from giving lessons to giving lessons at the highest level. Uh, just like your sort of 36,000-foot view of the whole thing there, because in my experiences, I feel like the, the common club golfer, thinks that the pros do different stuff from them. Let, mm -hmm. Help us with the truth, please. It isn't, uh, there's anything different. 
uh, one of my favorite, you know, we talk about the importance of the fundamentals, you know, grip, stance, posture, alignment, right? Mm -hmm. That's the cornerstone of professional golf and in golf instruction. Yeah. So I started coaching Scott and um, we were about eight months into our coaching and he was really struggling and we started and he wins the Byron Nelson. Okay. Takes the next week off and he's playing the next week in uh, Westchester. And he calls me and said, Kip, I think you need to come out and see me at the open next week. I've lost it. Mm -hmm. So I fly out the red eye on Sunday night, get on the dry range and see him hitting a golf ball at ball straw. And I, ball straw, I think it was. And uh, he hits two balls and says, Scott, are you aiming at that red flag out in the distance? He said, yeah. I said, why don't you put a club down across your feet? Okay. So he puts a club down across the street. The feet steps back. He said, I flew you all the way out here for that. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Is that One true? of my greatest stories ever. I flew you all the way out here for that. Yeah, I guess you did. You know, if you didn't have the sense to put a club down across your feet, you know, and so that's kind of, you're always working fundamentals. Uh, you're not trying to make drastic changes. Uh, if they've gotten to that level, you try to figure out what the best they're capable of doing and what they're, when they're playing their best and when they go offline, it's generally speaking, it's somewhere in the, set up alignment grip ball position uh little things that they can get off into the rhythm or they get off in their turning cycles or whatever it is so their sequences get out yeah but their yeah. rote motions are pretty well established a wise so, man once told me he said something to the effect of most golf swings are ruined before the clubs even swung back just yeah, that's a pretty good way of saying it yeah, you know, Johnny Miller said if there's a tour player, probably 85% of the time that things go wrong, it's in the setup. Yeah. Okay. And that's pretty close. For the folks waiting for the Ben Hogan insights, you got to wait because this book has now been republished, if I get it correctly, right, Kip? Yeah, um, this, is, um, this is the new cover. All right. Um, it's, well, it's got one. different is it's got golf in front. All right. And the reason for that is that I wrote that book before the internet, so there was no search engines. So that book never showed up in the search engines because it didn't say golf anywhere. <laughs> so it was really a blunderhead move on my part, but I didn't know. So oh, yeah. we redid it. Now we have golf in there so people can see it. Well, it's become one of my new favorites. And uh, before we get to Hogan and ha the handle movement in the swing, chapter one here is the myths. And again, the book is titled What You Know Can Hurt You. And I want to just quickly read through these to you and have you just give your commentary okay these are top 10 golf instruction myths keep your head still keep your eyes on the ball keep your left arm straight keep your right belt elbow in close in the backswing keep your left side in control of the swing and don't use too much right hand keep your left heel on the ground to solidify your backswing turn you need to focus in the backswing cocking your wrist to build up angles for the downswing you start the downswing by pulling your right arm and elbow into your side you want to delay the uncocking of the wrist on the downswing until the last possible moment. John Jacobs is rolling over in his grave. <laughs> you want your eyes to watch the club head strike the ball, and you want to have a follow through with your hands and arms in a nice high position. And then there's an honorable mention list. You're swinging too hard or too fast, and you're coming over the top. Yeah, I call this stuff Advil for the golf swing because everyone has it. <laughs> And everyone just doles it out when someone's hitting the ball poorly. So give us your comment. Oh, it's just what you hear so much. You know, the, the left arm straight, I think, is probably the one of the worst enemies and keeping your head still. Yeah. Now, I'm not allowing, say, people move their head helter-skelter, but yeah. it's got to have freedom of motion. Uh, I love George Knudsen's line. He said, the head shows, shows no useful purpose in the golf swing other than to sit on top of your shoulders. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's a simplified version, but your body is rotating. Your head's got to rotate. Your eyes got to rotate. Some if you look at any player's head at the top of their backswing, their eyes are rotated somewhere around 30 degrees off to the right. Mm -hmm. Some more Dustin Johnson's probably 45 degrees rotated off to his right. Yeah. And Nichols even started with his head Loved off it. to the right. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, there's the head motion is a, is a tough one. Trying to keep your head down probably ruins more golfers than anything I can think Car of. Car accidents, I know. That's terrible, that one. <laughs> because it stops motion. Mm -hmm. You know, So if it stops motion, you just smash the club into the ball. What the heck are you doing? This, this is a swing. 
Yeah. And so I like to clarify what a swing is. It's something moving in a free and unrestricted arc around the center of motion. Yep. It's swinging around. The center's always moving. The club's got to be moving. You keep your head down, the center stops. Uh, so true. Else. Uh, so then you have nothing left but your arms to pull up into your body. So And then, then someone goes, are you chicken winging or something to that effect because you're trying to get to the follow through then. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of places you can go. I mean, if your head's down, your arms... They go, they go chicken wing. I find so, it comical because you've worked with elite golfers. You know, I've, I have to now work alongside them in the fairways on the PGA tour. And then you come back to your home club and someone miss hits a ball and the rider on the white horse comes in with uh, like, Oh, you're swinging too fast. And I'm like, right. let me tell you something on the PGA tour. Those that golf swing is like a <laughs> blur. It's going so quickly yet. They're hitting it straight. Right. Well, Hogan said, Harvey Pennick in his book asked Ben Hogan, what part of the golf ball do you look at? And Ben Hogan said, I have no clue. It's a total blur to me. <laughs> well, you think of a downswing from the top of your backswing to impact is 0. 0.22 seconds. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you got less than a quarter of a second. How are you going to watch something? Especially when your body is moving at the speed they're moving. There's just no way you can see it. It's a blur. Yeah. So you're wasting your time. Here's, here's a personal question um, before we get out to how the handle moves through contact. And, you know, a lot of folks would say that, you know, impact is the most important time in the golf swing. But right. I'll ask you this, Kip. I want your take. Impact, obviously, we message the golf ball. But all the legends I've spoken with, and you mentioned Watson earlier, Tom Watson, that is, he was like, you know, the change of direction between back and downswing. That to me was where the magic happened. That set up contact. So where That's do you lie on, on this subject? It, that is the moment of truth. I mean, uh, if you've got an adequate, you know, you're all set up and good and you make a good turn, the change of direction is where most players, when they're playing on the tour or any level of high level, the misses usually are coming from the change of sequence and this motion change at the top. Mm -hmm. They get quicker. They get shorter in the backswing, they get nervous, they get jumpy, the wind gusts shut, comes up, whatever it is, and it gets them out of their rhythm and out of their sync. And so the, to me, the change of direction is the moment of truth. And then from that point on, it's just fly. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to make the cardinal sin here, but I'm going to do it anyway, because you shouldn't take another man's medicine and golf instruction is very personal, even though they are fundamentals to respect. Right. I want you to say, I want you just for everyone listening and watching to this to say, look, if you were, if they were with you and you were going to say to them one key to changing direction properly, could you share something like that, even though it's generic, please? Most of the time it's arm pressure for the amateur golfer. Mm -hmm. All right. Arm, arm, too much grip pressure, too much tension, too much anticipation of making a hit. So they get to the top and they see that ball and they want to hit it and everything gets rushed. Gotcha. And the last thing you want to do is rush the hands down because then you just lost all your power. It's similar to a baseball throw. You know, your body goes back and your body has to go forward and your arms just kind of waits there for a little bit. You don't go and throw your arm, right? So it's a, it's a sequence and the same thing in the golf swing. It's just got to wait. And uh, that's where the average golfer doesn't have the patience for because their main object is to hit the stupid ball instead of swing the golf club. So I do make a big focus on learning what a swing is and making yeah. the club move. Well, free. folks, go and get this book. It, you can search golf now and find it because it basically takes you through the golf swing from address to the follow through and the Kip's direction. Okay, now we've transitioned well and I asked you, okay, what do you want to talk about? And you send me two pictures of Ben Hogan and I started salivating. And then you were talking about how the handle moves and where it's at its lowest and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, yes, let's do this. Uh, so, so give us the theme of it. Describe where you want to go with the handle movement. And then we'll just, we'll, we'll kind of go from there, please. Well, it's, it's come from a long time to me when I, I was very fortunate to watch Ben Hogan hit golf balls and Lee Trevino and, um, they played together in 1967 in Houston, and uh, I was really tempted to take my clubs and throw them in the bayou. I mean, those guys hit the ball so well, it was frightening. And I was 
at the end of the round, a reporter comes up to Ben Hogan. At this time, Trevino was absolutely unknown. He had finished sixth in the U.S. Open before, and no one had heard of him. But now he's playing with Ben Hogan. And so they say, what do you think of that funny-looking swing of Lee Trevino's? Mm -hmm. And Hogan looked at him with a look of almost disdain, saying that is no funny golf swing. He's got the longest flat spot of anybody I've seen on the tour since I retired. Right. And I'm going... I'm I just take kind of taken aback. I'm going long flat spot. What the heck is he talking about? And I started thinking about it and you start realizing that the only way you can achieve a stable club face through the ball is you have to be coming in from a shallow position with your hands. Okay. So I start looking at all the players and the handle of the golf club reaches its lowest position, usually right by the right thigh and the shafts parallel to the ground. Stop, stop, that there, point, stop there. Say that again, because I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions in golf because, you know, golf. Hit down uh, on it. I've got to hit down on it. Exactly. So the handle gets, they think I've got to keep going downward. Yes, but it's that's not the truth. That's exactly where I'm heading. That's the, that's right. the curve. Yes. You know, so they get up there and they pull the handle down. Well, you get to the handle when it's parallel to the ground being the lowest, the butt end of the club from that point is going up. So yeah. the shaft is much like a hockey stick. Yes. It's, it's, it's moving up while the, the bottom is moving down. And that's how a divot is taken. A divot is not taken by a direct blow down. It's this motion. I, I think you can understand what I mean by that. So that is the motion that provides some torque where your body can twist and go. And now you can fire up. Well, now you can use ground forces. Yeah. I never thought about ground forces when I was learning this, but I, I, as it turned, I always had an expression, the club has got to come in from low in order for your body to turn to high. Yes. And so. if you come down all the way, you cannot turn up. So that's when I started really looking at this. And now with all the ground force information, everything, it's all being verified over the years. But I had several arguments with people about this years ago. They said, no, you got to hit it down. I go, that's not what the good players are doing. You know, it's, it's this way. The well, I, up. yeah, I saw some 3D information now, and, and all of 3D is proving your theory correct, where Rory McIlroy, who I would argue is probably one of the most virtuoso ball strikers I've ever seen. It's like he fell out of heaven just hitting the ball. Oh, yeah. You, even when he was 18 years old, I was salivating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, and they measured him, and you talk about where his hands were the lowest or all good strikers, which is over the trail thigh. Right. Rory's hands were moving at their fastest. And remember, the, remember, folks listening, the golf swing is circular. It's not linear. So they were moving the fastest toward the target when his left arm was basically parallel with the ground. So just a, f a foot or so into the downswing. The rest right. of the time, the, the sideways acceleration in the handle was actually slowing down because he's going up and leftward instead of pulling that handle hard towards the target. And so many right. guys to do that in the interests of sharp leaning are the folks who can't square the face up in time. So I'd love your commentary. Right. Well, I've seen, I'm sure you have too, many demonstrations of shaft lean. Yes. And they'll show them at a dress and all they do is just jam their hands down. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, well, that, if you, if you went there and actually hit a golf ball, the club would be impaled in the earth and never could get out. Sure. <laughs> I mean, if they're, if your hands are three inches lower or two inches lower than they were to dress and the shaft to get your shaft to lean, you're, you can't hit a golf ball that way. It's true. And then a lot of folks too, will lay your downswing and through swing. And a lot of, there's a lot of brouhaha about the downswing. The downswing is such a short period of time. Most of right. it, to your observation, is the upswing of the handle, and I sound like Eddie Merrins now. Right, right. Yeah. It's... Um, I want to. I, I want to ask this along those lines. Right. So now the creating of the up out of the handle, because I can imagine folks going, "All right, Kip said so," and Mark's basically fanboy, and they start pulling the handle <laughs> manually. And folks watching on YouTube, I'm basically lifting and buckling. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Where does the up come from, please? What's the correct upswinging mechanism? Well, I think you've got it established by the time you're low, that club is flying. Yeah. If you're doing it correctly, and that club's going to go away from you. Yeah. And if this goes away from you, your left arm's going to go away from you, and the left arm form is going to start to rotate over. I mean, that's just 
almost like you can't stop it because your body's turning out of the way. When you got the club that low and you start moving, you, you're you going, that club just goes. And that's when you feel that club go, that's what Bobby Jones called the let go. Yes, okay. He, he said you know, any suggestion of, the, he said the suggestion of impact is a suggestion of too much finality. The club should not be stopped or even impeded after at the ball or after the ball. The club should be let go totally free and that now allows the club head to pull you to the finish and that so let go that, that handle down low and you're coming through whew, that club just will fly that it let go fly. that let go folks and golf has got a fancy jargony sort of a name and that's the release got to release yeah. the club release the club that's just the energy of it letting it go i just think it's better to let it go i mean if you let it go it's going to release um it takes a certain amount of faith to let it go um, look, I want to talk about that in a minute, but I, I'm going to mine this a little bit more because I asked you, okay, what creates the up and you described it. Would you contend, and this is me asking one instructor to another, would you contend that most golfers are traveling or swaying laterally towards the target too long? So as a result, it's really hard to get that handle to go upward and leftward like it should be going at the right time. They will tend to go too far forward with upper body. Yes. And, but more upper body dominant yeah. to get their upper body going because that's where the ball is. So their heads start to move forward. Now you look at a good player at the start of transition, their head may move just a bit first. And then from that point on, it's ever going to, it's going to stay or it's going to go back. Yeah. The impact. And so that that's allowed the body to clear. So I would say the lateral motion is somewhat arm driven and somewhat upper body not necessarily lower body, but it can be lower body. I mean, it just depends on what the person's you know, doing, but I would say it's more upper body tendency. Well, I would say, and you've seen them hit. If you think of Hogan and Trevino with long flat spots, the only way you create that long flat spot is if you're kind of working inside of your feet. If, if you're lower yeah. body, yes. you got all soupy legs underneath you, you've got no chance then. Right. No, exactly. I, I want to talk about the timing of this movement because I'm, we all are now we're like, okay, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. And then there's this angst about like creating up or, or having the handle go from low over the trail thigh to upward and inward as the club has let go. Um, talk about the timing of this mechanism, because I feel like a lot of folks will be worried about, okay, I'm at my right thigh now. Do I go? I mean, this happens all in the blink of an eye. Is it hard to time or what would you advise? Well, what I'll do with people is I'll just take my shaft of my golf club yeah. and I'll, I'll, let's say the butt end of the club at their address position, I'll put my shaft like seven inches to the right of it yeah. and about the same elevation as the butt end of the club. And I'll just hold it there and say, get your hands lower than this butt end of the club by this point. Okay. Your hands got to get under the shaft. All right. I say, once they get down there, I said, now we're here to go. And they go, well, I got to go this. And they move up. Just naturally. Because they can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost instinctive. You know, if you take a little half backswing, people take a little half backswing and take a swing through, they can hit it pretty good. Yeah. When Because our hands are already low. They're not up. It's just getting to that spot here where then it becomes almost a natural happenstance. I mean, a they don't go low, go, okay, now do I do? I say, well, make a swing. And they go, and their hands go up, and the club starts to go in this fashion. Mm -hmm. So the main thing is getting the idea of where that club's got to get to at that point. And it's uh, it's not, again, it's not linear. It's sort of an area. It's just reaction. And 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 the amazing thing about it, in my experience, and I'd love your your addition or, your, or whatever your thoughts are, it's amazing how, even though you feel like the handle's going up, the physics of this with the head is accelerating to catch up with the hands actually makes the divot after the ball, which is just crazy right. to believe, but it's all just pure physics. Right. It is. The, yeah. the divot comes with the handle going up, which is hard, to hard for people. Hard for people to grasp. Here's the, here's the theory. If folks imagine a skier behind a boat. And to, you know, when you ski out to the side, if the boat's traveling forward and it turns around in a sharp circle, the skier gets slung out. Everyone right. understands that. You're right. But the club's like the boat and the club heads like the skier. But people are yeah. so 
they're so loath to try that though. They, it doesn't make sense to what they've been taught. Yeah, that's the problem. Everybody hit down, hit down, and they get so. And, and you try to get them low, they say, "Well, I'm going to hit the ground back there." Mm -hmm. I said, "You might the first couple times, you know, but if you keep doing it, you're going to find out you can move, and you're going to move totally different." Um, like, kind of going back to the same subject matter, I like to pull up old things that I saw, but. I went to the San Diego Open down to the old Stardust Country Club and back when I was probably 14 years old and Gay Brewer is hitting golf balls on the range mm -hmm. and he's got a piece of a coat hanger, like, like the bottom piece of the coat hanger turned into a L. Okay. okay, so he's got his golf ball here. He puts it on the outside of the, of the club. He puts it four inches behind the ball and he made a bridge. So That's if he splits it down the ground, so that hanger is hanging over almost the top of his ball four inches behind the ball. So he's trying to swing under that bridge to hit yeah. the ball. I'm watching this. And so this is where a lot of this stuff came from me just learning happenstance as I'm growing up. And I'm looking at him. I say, Mr. because there's no one else there. And he's talking to me as the you know, viewers very friendly. I said, why is that thing there? He said, I want to make sure I'm hitting into the ball, not down to the ball. Oh, I love that. And oh. I thought that's another one of the things that kind of gets my mind thinking is that that's that's in that's got more force than this you know what you've just brought some clarity to a tip that i got as a young golfer from our club professional back in south africa that it was such a great visual that i still use it but i guess i sort of and now you i understand it better where his tip was he said to me mark i want you to imagine that there's like a nine inch nail right through the middle of the golf ball pointing down the target line because i want right. you to drive that nail straight through the ball Right. To do that, you've got to get the face appropriated. Right. You be hitting flat like you are, not downward. You're right. going to buckle the nail then. Right. That's, it's the same premise. But this this causes a penalty. If you hit the hanger, you know you didn't do it. You right. know, so, of course, you don't. You can't visualize a nail because it's not going to actually happen. But it, I actually used to make those when I was back at my first head pro job. And I got in trouble because the green superintendent said, you know, Kip, I, I've seen you use that drill with your students, but don't leave the hangers out there. They ruin the mowers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so, so essentially, anyway. you've, un, you've, you've dispelled a myth of hitting down on the ball, which is, again, I, and I'm getting back to the book now because I just love it so very much. Um, I would think, because then I'm a big one of like learning the thing like you've taught now, and someone's like, right, I understand that. But now I want to go and do it. I would think, and I want your take, please, that if someone went and hit balls off an upslope, just a gradual upslope, they would probably learn what you're talking about here, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Another one is actually a side hill high ball above your feet. Okay. You can't hit down on those. <laughs> you're never going to hit a shot. So it has to become more of a swing around yourself with the ball above you. Well, I would oh. say both of those two with the swinging around and the swinging up the hill, they sort of come from a fairly centric, stable sort of a body action. Again, there can't be too much side to side or, or lifting. No, you'll, you'll fall off the hill if you get through too much one way or the other. Yeah, no kidding. Um, okay, so, so I got ahead of myself back to the book. Some of these myths, uh, I want to dispel them a little further. Like you talk here, I was a victim of this. You got to meet Ben Hogan. I just read his books back and mm -hmm. forth, back and forth, cover to cover all the time. And they became right. a Bible to me. Right. And I, from the Ravielli pictures, would jam my trail elbow into my side so hard. I never really hit the ball with any real authority. Right. So I want you to talk to folks now, because we've talked about the downswing and the handle action, sort of where that trail elbow lives, because I've seen countless folks with a towel under themselves and they just got no athleticism whatsoever on that back arm. Right. I, I don't know exactly because you know, I think some of it's going to be your anatomical build. You know, yeah. he's actually, you know, Hogan wasn't tall. And so he could be club more in because he could be on a flatter plane. Sure. You take a Nicholas, you know, he was not much taller, but I think his body was totally different anatomically. All right. And, uh, so he was very upright, so his elbow is not going to be jammed in. Uh, Victor Hoffman's elbow wouldn't be. You know, there's a lot of players that aren't jammed in, but then you take John Rahm and it never gets away from his side. <laughs> so, okay. 
you know, you, you have to kind of say that it's not an ab absolute. The problem is the elbow comes to the side, not by pulling your elbow in. Yes. It comes from your arms waiting and your body starting to move and the club just falls. Gotcha. There's not me. It's not me trying to get it in. That'd be like me trying to throw a ball and going like this. I, I, I couldn't throw it. It'd just be, a, it's a soft movement. It's not a purposeful, hard movement. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Um, along those lines too, I'll never forget, you know, spending time around Larry, you know, he's always so wise. And the one thing he was non-negotiable on was something he learned from you. He actually referenced your name. And he said, Kip always wanted me to feel like the club head was going its fastest after contact. And I absolutely loved that because to right. your point about how the elbow goes because of how your body does. If right. it's disorganized in transition, the speed will not be in that area. Yes. Right. Right. So they share, did. Share the drill. Yeah. Yeah. You want to, I think every tour player that I was around, they always feel the club speed. You know, I say, when do you feel the most speed? It's usually like two feet to three feet past the ball. Mm -hmm. That's when they feel it. Yeah. That isn't where the speed is, it's oh. where they feel it. Gotcha. Just like me throwing a ball. If I throw a baseball, I let go of the ball. My arm feels like it goes the fastest after I let go. I feel a snap in my arm, right? I don't feel a snap when I'm still holding the ball. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the letting go, right? That's the letting go. And so, you know, Hogan and Claude Harmon were really good friends. Mm -hmm. And I heard Butch one time say that both, both Hogan and Claude agreed that you want to have your speed from the ball to the finish. I thought that was an interesting way. And the only way that happens is if that handle is not close to the ground. It's going up for it, huh? <laughs> it can't go <laughs> fast if you're going down. We've, just, uh, we, we've done a big roundabout to get back to the same thing. Um, one more here before I let you go. I appreciate your time. Um, you, uh, Here we go. You need to focus, and this is why I joked about John Jacobs, who's like a mentor of mine. It's like, you want to delay the uncocking of the wrist on the downswing until the last possible moment. And here's the thing, you know, those swing sequences, I've got every single one that was ever available. I used to cut them out and save them in a file. And you right. see these greats right before the ball, how there's lag. And so many right. players have undone themselves by trying to lag the club head. So I want your, your parting shot there, please. Yeah, I think, again, people that have cast are coming steep. Yeah, their hands are coming steep. I mean, I've I've looked at so many people that anybody that throws a club out, their hands can't get low. To me, so lag is just a matter of getting the hands down. Then mm. you, because you can, if you throw it, you can't get your hands down. Gotcha. So if you get your hands down, it's going to be a it's a it's a fire out. Um, so trying to jam it's, again it's like the right elbow trying to jam your hands down there and say okay now and to me feel... that's just a impossible thing to try to do in you know this much space you know you got to have a whole sense of the bottom gotcha got the it's not a it's not a, you can't time this you it has to go so basically if you let it go free the club will square so I would think along those lines, though, if people listening to this or watching you just were watching your, you were demonstrating with your arms. If they just took Lee Trevino and Hogan at their words with the longest flat spot, they'd probably unload those wrists at the correct time to make the flat spot longer. You can't make the flats that long with wrists flipping around. <laughs> I can tell okay. you. No, you know, you know, said, I like to put the club on the ground four feet behind the ball and just drag it through the ground. That's what he said. He just drag it through the ground. You well, said put so? Put the club on the ground, put it three feet behind the ball and drag it through to your finish. Make it go along the earth. And you said start that? feeling that Trevino did. Trevino said that. Okay. Yeah. One more follow up. <laughs> I've got thousands. Um, we, the internet, you joked about it earlier, and search engines. If someone right. types in their golf swing or tips, you'll hear about early extension because everyone's crowing about it. Uh, you'll right. hear wrist alignments because everyone's going on about that now, um, which no one talked about just a little while ago, but now all of a sudden it's the thing. They should have been talking a long time ago. With all of this long flat spot and stuff, 
I want you to talk to people about the cocking and the uncocking of the wrist because a lot of folks kind of misunderstand that thing, you know. Back in the day, folks were a little bit more cupped in the wrist, right? if you will. Nowadays, folks are tending the opposite way. Where does Kip sit on this place? Well, a lot of that's dependent on the grip. So uh, if I'm Freddie Couples, I better not be, I better not be Freddie Couples and have my grip like that. Yeah. That club's going to be about 40 degrees closed at the top of the back swing. Uh -huh. So I think what, what we've seen is that there's the grip has gone more in towards the neutral side versus the stronger side with a lot of players. And then if they're in the neutral side, you can still get that angle fairly easy. And that just delay allows the club to stay stable. Yeah. Um, I know Claude Harmon said that this position was a square position. He, he liked to see the face shut. That for the folks listening only, that's uh, Kip is showing slightly bowed or slightly right. extended. Yeah, the, face the, pointing right. the, the face points more like where the club is more up in the air, yeah. right? And if you're open, the face would point more down. And this is still a killer position for people. I've been, I've known that for, that's been around for a long time, but I think it's become very popular to try to get the club here. I had a student in the other day that went up the top wide open, came down to here. He's dead. Perfect. In transition again. Yeah. You well, know, that... so he, he kind of took it up here and did this and he did it on his load. So the club had done what it's supposed to do. And he was in a great position and he went through the ball beautifully. Do I need to get rid of that? <laughs> do I go through the hassle of trying to do that and get his rhythm out? No, I just left him alone. I said, okay, you're open, but you're saving it perfectly. And he still hit the ball quite far. And I didn't, I just left it alone. I would so, I'm so glad about it. I would so, I'm so glad that you would say that because, you know, instruction nowadays because of the internet is so, sort of so absolute and people are just shouting at each other if you sit on the opposite side of the fence um because i remember you know the whole movement to the wrist being more flexed or more bowed at the top you know closed right uh, where will zalatoris showed up and he is a flusher and he'd be right. sort of neutral and the wrist would go into cupping on the way down and then he'd square it off then he, then he squared it up and people right. it was blowing their minds, but he did it consistently. So I'm, I, I want you to sign off with that because in the end, I guess it's your swing and you've just got to do the right things to square off and get that long, low, flat spot, right? Oh, the, yes. The, there's a guy, I, I wish I could remember his name, but I was told, I heard a video of his, but he's talking about the only thing that he had in 3D analysis is discovered is that the player, he got to the top of the club and closed, mm -hmm. Dustin Johnson. Yes. They got off the top and squared and closed at transition, or they came down no later than chest high and the club went to closed. So they all get the close somewhere around chest high on the downswing. They are. Whether and so if you start looking at it that way, you realize there's different ways to get there that can be very functional. Uh they can be tour level. It's just a matter of is this going to guarantee every player that comes through that they're going to hit it great, but that's all they think about? No, because if you go here and go you have the wrong path, the wrong sequences, you're still going to be in trouble. Dan, you're cooked. Your text to me said um, you were talking about how the, the flat spot works, and then you text you emphatically, I might add, this works all the way through the bag. <laughs> and so I want you to finish with that because most folks are like, Okay, well, I've got to get the handle working up, but I'm going to thin my chip shots or my pitch shots. This is applicable throughout the swing, this long, low raising. The pitch shot is still going up. Butt end's going up on a pitch shot. Definitely. <laughs> okay. That's the only way you can get the flange on the ground. You yeah. can't get the club to come down with the flange going, I mean, the handle going down all the way and hit a pitch shot. You know what's funny? I'm watching you. And again, folks, you've got to get to YouTube so you can see, because every time Kip talks, he shows us what's going on. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> it's no, it's, good. it's fantastic. <laughs> the, there was a movement at the time, you know, when all the great PGA Tour players were talking about exposing the bounce of the lob wedge or the sand wedge through contact. And, you know, they're releasing the wrists early to build loft into the face. Right. So a lot of amateur golfers then hear this and they're throwing their wrists at the golf ball and the club looks like an angry cat's tail through contact. Yeah. And, <laughs> I've like, seen that. Yeah. What, what you're talking about, he has, if you're doing the right thing with the handle and it's going up, 
that club is releasing and overtaking you without you having to even throw your wrist angles out whatsoever. You know, it's kind of fun to do for, I tell, I tell people, if you just took a club here and you had it straight up and down and yeah. you just did a circle, when the club gets to there, the butt on the club is going up. You okay. can't get down to the bottom. Keep, keep doing that. I'm going to describe this for the radio folks. What Kip is doing, well, but here, the, the club is of, right here, which yeah? way the butt on the club is going up. So what Kip's doing, all right, is he's got an imaginary club in front of him and he's basically ma making what look like um, counterclockwise oh, right. circles. Right. He's basically right. making a circle. And you're right. right. When the club starts to go downward, it's, it's shouting and up. the wrist is popping. Yeah. Love it. So that's what I, I call this the whirly bird. All right. If you could, you watch a good player on the golf course, they're standing around, they're doing this all the time. They're always swinging the club around. They're always making circles. Well, there is a circle to the bottom of the swing. <laughs> it's I that. I could tell you one thing's for certain. If you you can't see off my camera right over there, I've got a bag of golf clubs. When I put this call down, I'm going to go and fiddle with a whirly bird because that is brilliant. I folks need to do that more often. <laughs> well, I use that for pitching all the time. So basically, you want to feel like the club is just going like this. It's not that you're throwing it down; it's just letting it go down. Runyon used to tell me that the problem with most people pitching is they don't, at their address position, leave the club enough room to get to the bottom. In other words, they get over the ball and they stay down, so the club is going to hit the ground too early. He said, you want to feel like when you're setting up for a pitch that you're almost too high and the club can't quite get to the ground. So when you swing, the club get the weight will be able to go down as you're moving yourself up. So that's why you see every good pitcher in the ball, their head is actually going up at impact. And Paul Runyon, folks, uh, he's uh, given lessons to people like time ago. Yeah. yeah, well, he's given lessons to folks like Jack Nicholas and company. So Mr. Runyon knew what was going on. Yes, he did. You know, he said underreach versus overreach. You want to underreach on a pitch. All right. Kip, love you. Thanks for joining me. Tell folks where they can find the book. Golf, what you know can hurt you, please. It's now on Amazon. I think it's pre-ordered. Uh, it's going to be available maybe sooner than november 30th it may come out sooner out there i am not sure yet but i know they have it now okay, you can perfect. see it on the web page and there'll be a kindle one following up shortly but awesome. it's um that's where it is and for the golf schools i know there's a website share that and also you're available on social media so what are the handles there please uh avr golf academy is the web uh avr golf academy.com a-v-i-a-r-a avr golf academy yeah. Uh, our handle is Peterball Golf on Instagram, but we may be in the middle of changing that. So, uh, but uh, that's what we're doing on that. And uh, we're actually just making a little bit of a push. We've been kind of slow to the market on that for a bunch of dinosaurs. <laughs> don't, don't do a lot of social media, but we're going to try to do some more. Well, folks, you can just search KIP, K I P, and then Peter Bar, P, P U T E R B A U G H. KIP, thank you for your time. This has been so much fun. And it's been a pleasure to connect with you. Thanks for joining us. And I enjoyed it. And good luck with you at CBS. I hear you're to be walking the fairways. Yeah, I've been doing so for a while. Um, it's the thrill of a lifetime, and I'm somewhat, um, somewhat amazed that 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 they've allowed me to do this job. I feel like I haven't gone this far in my dreams. So, so it's a great thrill. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good luck, and uh, we'll see you in the broadcast. Appreciate you.